my childhood. I was born and raised in Rockford, Illinois, Northwest Rockford. Went to West High School, graduated in 1962, about 100 years ago. And uh, I, I enjoyed high school. I had a job working in a grocery store for almost all the time I was at West High School. But I, was, I participated in wrestling, on the wrestling team, went to the football games, basketball games, just typical things that you do in high school. I began hearing about it a little bit after high school. I went to Northern Illinois University for a semester and then transferred to the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, and as time went along, we, you know, we heard more about it. By 1960, Four, I believe it was when the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred, you began hearing a lot more about it because they were uh, drafting and building up the military forces for deployment to Vietnam. In July of 1954 was when it all started. After World War II, Japan withdrew their forces from Vietnam, leaving Emperor Bao Dai in control. As soon as opportunity had risen to take control, Ho's Viet Minh forces rose up taking over Hanoi and declaring a Democratic Republic of Vietnam with Ho Chi Minh as their new president. Both Japan and France wanted the same thing. The problem was, Ho and his supporters wanted a nation represented after other communist countries, while France, along with several others, wanted Vietnam to be close economically with cultural ties to the West. When the Cold War arised, the United States took immediate action. In the following year of 1955, the U.S. President, Dwight D. Eisenhower, assured Diem, the Prime Minister of South Vietnam, that he would provide aid. With the help of equipment and training from American troops, 100,000 Vietnam Communists were arrested, many relentlessly tortured before being executed. When 1957 came about, enemies from South Vietnam and Viet Cong began fighting against government officials, and in 1959, the Viet Cong forces began intervening South Vietnam with firefights, which involved guns instead of bombs and weapons. When President John F. Kennedy arrived in South Vietnam, he reported bad conditions to his team and suggested escalating their American military along with economical and industrial military to help Diem repel the threat against Viet Cong. The domino theory created by Dwight D. Eisenhower expresses that if one Southeast Asian country falls to communism, other countries would pursue after. Furthermore, Kennedy increased aid, although he cut short of agreeing to a large sale convention. Finally, in 1962, U.S. military in Vietnam totaled in 9,000 troops with fewer than 800 in 1950. In 1954, when the Gulf of Tonkin incident began, it all started with an American ship, the USS Maddox. While the ship performed a radar sweep of the North Vietnamese coast, the ship was attacked from North Vietnamese torpedo patrol boats. Shortly after, the USS Ticonderoga carrier promptly sent out aircrafts. Well, you could go to your draft board and find out if and when they were going to draft you. I was out of college. I uh, dropped out. Actually got expelled, anyway, for refusing to go to ROTC classes, of all things. 
But uh, we, me and three other friends went to the draft board to find out when they were going to draft us. Three of us on September 10th, fourth guy on October 10th, 1965. You had an opportunity to go enlist. I grew up in that Northwest Rockford neighborhood, and on our block was Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson had been a Marine in World War II. As small boys, he was our hero. I mean, we. He'd tell us stories and show us things about the Marines. 1965, I was uh, turning 21, and uh, I did not want to be a Marine. I thought, jeepers, this sounds like Marines will be fighting this war in the jungle. So I talked to my three friends, and we decided we would enlist in the U.S. Navy for a three-year enlistment versus the draft was for two years of active duty. And by the way, when you asked your draft board, well, which branch will you draft us into, they did not know. They said, you go for your physical, and they sign you out. So uh, we joined, and uh, my one friend, uh, Bud, he ended up going to Naples, Italy, and playing in the Navy band for his three years. Another one of my buddies, Tony, he went to electronic school, then got on a ship on the East Coast, and they made what's called Mediterranean cruises. I ended up in Vietnam, so I was 75% correct, and I heard about it from my friends. When did you first realize boot camp was different from civilian life? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, we arrived in San Diego about 11 o'clock at night, flying out of Chicago, and it was they put us in a barracks, and it was noisy, and guys were talking, and they were yelling at the top of their lungs, you know. You're going to get up at 4 a.m. 4 o'clock in the morning, they woke us up and put us into some type of a ranks and marched us off to chow, to breakfast. Guys were doing talking, smoking cigarettes, being yelled at by the, the uh, boot camp administrator or whoever. He, he was a chief petty officer. After breakfast, they took us to get uniforms, and our civilian clothes were gone. Then they took us to the, sh the barber shop and shaved our heads. And then they put us in ranks and it got very quiet. And we realized, ooh, these guys mean business. Uh, basic training to me was like, I think, being in jail. Uh, it was very regimented. You know, you, had to, you got up at a certain hour every day and marched off to chow and then did all kinds of physical exercises, attended classes on you know, naval ships and what have you. I couldn't wait to get out of basic training. I was scheduled to be out on December 21st, 1965. Uh, I turned 21 on December 23rd, 1965. And the way it worked in basic training, uh, during the latter stages of it, they said, uh, on your final day, you'll pack your sea bag, you'll go out on what they call the grinder, we would call it the blacktop, and uh, call out your name in alphabetical order and you go up and get your orders. And then you leave to go home for 14 days, what's called boot camp leave. And he said, some of you may not get orders that day and have to stay a little while longer. Of course, there were thousands of us there. You don't think it's gonna be you, it was me. I was a uh, seaman, apprentice, when I got out of basic training, like everybody is and I was assigned uh, to education and training on the USS Princeton, which was a three-man office, and it was pretty easy, and it was fun, and we played a lot of poker. So we administered uh, GED exams uh, that you could take in the Navy if you were not a high school graduate. They even had a five-level collegiate exam that you, uh, you could take and see how you could do at that. We made an entire, what's called a cruise, and that's at least a year. Uh, I was on the Princeton, it might have been 13 months. Keeps moving all the time, up and down the coast, changing directions, what have you. Uh, so we could anchor off, off the coast in Da Nang. Uh, the way I got into Da Nang and Saigon was I knew the helicopter pilots by, after a while, I got to be friends with them. And if they were making a trip in there for military purposes, I'd just hitchhike on the helicopter and go with them. Just say, I'll be back in a couple days. So it was, it was kind of nice. 
The trip to Australia <coughs> was for the annual Coral Seas Festival and the senior petty officer in each division on the ship had to pick one individual to go down there for this holiday. I was the senior. I went. <laughs> I had a chance to see Australia. I'm going to take it. And uh, really enjoyed that country. They're good people. Good, good people. A lot of people, a lot of the natives in South Vietnam that I met, you know, they just really seemed like everybody else, you know, they just didn't like the war, they wanted to have families, you know, have a job, just live. But it didn't quite work that way. Well, I didn't develop a bad attitude toward the Viet Cong until we got an opportunity later on. Uh, so later when I got to fly into Saigon and Da Nang and places like that, Camera Bay, and of course they lecture you that the nice people you see on the street during the day may well be VC at night and might want to shoot you. Uh, but other than that, I had no adverse feelings about them one way or another. It was their country. We tend to live in the future and plan our lives so far ahead, just thinking we will live a long, happy life. For those who serve, they go in knowing they may not come back alive and would be honored to die for their country. The United States Marine Corps motto is Semper Fidelis, also known as Semper Fi, established in 1883. Semper Fi is more of a sincere hello and much more than just a goodbye. It's a mindset, a mentality, a perspective, an attitude. Semper Fi to all Marines who we had to say goodbye to way too soon. We carried Marines and we would fly them in and out of uh, engagements. We also did medevacs on those, both those ships. I spent many nights up on the flight deck with red lights on, that's all they would have on, carrying wounded Marines and getting them down to the ship's uh, hospital room, I guess. Saw some pretty gr gruesome stuff. Um, what was the feelings that are going through during that time, or the emotions when you're helping out? I gotta tell you, frankly, initially it was nausea. You know, when you see somebody on a stretcher and their stomach is hanging out or part of their face is blowing off, and they're in agony, you know, and you're carrying them down to be treated. It was nausea. After that, it was just anger that we even had to do this type thing. You know, what, what the heck are we doing in Vietnam? Did you end up losing um, some close friends? One. Yeah, I wouldn't really say, I don't know what you mean by close friend, but I knew him pretty well. When he was on the ship, we hung around together and visited and talked about things back home and what we were going to do in the future. He was one of the guys that we were going to, there was a bunch of us getting out of the Navy about the same time, September, October of 68. One of them was a nephew of Birch Baia. Uh, he was a senator from Indiana. Didn't look like Birch by he had a handlebar mustache and tattoos. Uh, but he had a, his family had a, a, a sailing ship that they kept in San Diego. And we had all talked about getting together in uh, late October of 68, and we were gonna sail that thing to Australia. Uh, I went to Australia at one time on R&R, &R, and uh, we never did. Unfortunately, you know, guys got out and they got home and I met a girl and they met, you know, somebody got a job or whatever. And it's all talk.
Last day in the Navy light. Wonderful. <laughs> Had a nice ceremony, got to see some good friends on the ship, and actually I took off about 9 o'clock at night, and why well, wait three more hours? Went to LA International, caught a flight to Chicago, and, and went home. It wasn't what a lot of people experienced. I didn't have people yelling at me or, you know, calling me a baby killer or anything like that at all. You know, uh, and keep in mind, I flew out around midnight, and then got into Chicago in the middle of the morning uh, before the sun came up and uh, caught the bus home, you know. We dropped more bombs on North Vietnam during the Vietnam War than we dropped in all of World War II. Uh, and the end result was we lost the war. And you, I remember they, they had nice names for things. We were going to pacify South Vietnam, the Viet Cong. You know, in other words, we we're going to go in and build them some really nice schools and, and uh, really help build their infrastructure. And, and they'll love us, and uh, everything will be hunky-dory. Uh, that did not happen. You know, they did attempt a pacification program, but because the people of South Vietnam simply did not support their government. I know when we were doing operations in Vietnam, we did them many times jointly with the uh, Arvon. That, would be, that was the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese Army. They always got the flu just before the operation began. I mean, they seldom wanted to go in and fight. Well, you ask yourself, why is that? Because they didn't want to die for a government that they knew was corrupt and held out no hope for them. I, I would say by the end of 1968, I was early convinced that Vietnam was completely wrong and we should get out as quickly as we can. It wasn't worth any more American lives or dollars. It just simply wasn't. I don't really call it anti-war. I call it anti-political de uh, decisions that, that are made, you know, and hard to back out of. I'm sure President Johnson, I don't think of him as an evil man. I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing. Uh, but he, there's, a, there's two tape recordings out there one when Johnson was president, one when Nixon was president. And both of them have ex almost exactly the same statement on them. In the case of President Johnson, he was meeting with his Secretary of Defense, and that was uh, a fellow from Wisconsin, uh, Mel Laird, I believe. And Laird is on the tape, he says to the president, it's an unwinnable war. Johnson says, I know, I know, but I can't be the first American president to lose a war. Flash forward a couple years and now Richard Nixon's in the White House and he's talking with his Secretary of Defense, McNamara. McNamara says almost exactly the same thing to him, unwinnable war. And Nixon says, I, I think I agree, but I can't be the first American president to lose a war. So we got one man sitting in the White House who's more worried about his legacy than, what did we lose, 58,000 killed in Vietnam? <coughs> Untold number of, of uh, injured people and people who suffered other problems because of the war. And think of the civilian population that perished in those wars. And that's the price they paid for man's legacy, its history in the White House. There was no exit strategy. You might recall General Powell, who was a hero in the first Gulf War, was a wonderful speaker, came out with what's called the Powell Doctrine after that war. He said, this is how I view it. You do not go to war unless there's absolutely no other choice. 
you've exhausted every other means to avoid it. You don't go to, if you do have to go, you go with overwhelming force and you must have an exit strategy. All right, so throughout the year, my veteran's been Terry Hunt and he's made a huge impact on me. Um, when I first started the class, I didn't think I was going to stay in the class. I was, uh, had self-doubt. I didn't think I was good enough, and I was like, well, you have to be really smart to make a documentary, but it turns out uh, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and that definitely was not the case. When it came to about the first couple days of class, we got to choose what branch we wanted our veteran um, to choose from, and I chose the Navy, not only because I wanted to serve and I could not, but because my grandpa served, and my grandpa has been the biggest hero in my life, and I look up to him solely. Uh, when I first watched the interview of Terry Hunt, I was laughing, I was crying, I was uh, very just kind of neutral um, with a lot of things that he said and talked about his time in the war, before the war, what he's learned, and um, a whole bunch of things. I think that, you know, it's just amazing that from the beginning, from the middle, from the end, um, that these documentaries really make an impact on veterans, and especially Terry himself. You know, he has such a great personality. He's, you know, smiling and a, a great, uh, great person to talk to on the phone. And, um, you know, it's amazing. And I think it's awesome. And, you know, we make these documentaries for these veterans so that they will have it in future generations and it can be passed on and on. But when I got a phone call one day from him, and I tried getting a hold of him and he told me he was in the hospital with heart problems, my heart instantly dropped because I was afraid that I was never gonna meet him and I don't know what I would do. And that is just part of the reason why we do this class is to let them share their story, let them get out those feelings of what they went through that they never, probably never would have been able to do if it wasn't for this class. Many people suffer from PTSD. I have seen it in person and it is horrifying. And if it's horrifying to me, then I can't imagine what they have to go through. So after I found out Terry wasn't in the hospital, I made him a blanket. I went to the store, I spent $50 on fabric. I didn't care how much it was gonna cost, it was gonna get done, I was gonna make it for him because I felt like not only was making the doc important, but he's a person and he's important too. And, you know, I don't know how many friends he exactly he has, but I wanted to be someone that was gonna be there for him. And I continued to call and check up on him and make sure he was gonna be okay. And he's doing great. I mean, that man can really go. But, you know, it's just, I didn't even wanna risk the chance. 